It's my pleasure now to actually get to introduce our morning keynote, uh, Tanya Buckingham. Tanya is trained in, in both leadership and cartography. She is an organizational leader who believes in, that maps are critical tools to, to, to make for decision making in all aspects. Over the past 20 years, she has worked as a cartographer, both in the private industry and at the university. She served as president and executive director of the North American Cartographic Information Society. And last year, I have no clue why, <laughs> she uh, ran for office and now serves on the Dane County Board. Uh, so an elected official who understands what you do. It's, it's an amazing thing. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming.
From the area of the field in which we specialize to the goals of our office, I happen to have a lot of flexibility now where I am in cultivating a learning experience because I work on a university campus. But many of the things I'll talk about can be adapted and adopted into many work environments. Part of my mission in the lab is to support debate, research, and learning. <clears throat> in the private industry, our time to do these things was limited because we had to be billable for a certain percentage of our time. Both environments have their merits, and no matter which one I'm working in, I will always miss the other. I also know, as I've kept close relationships with the students, that I've read over the 10 years that I've been in the lab, that some cultures offer more opportunity for this type of environment than others. For the over 80 students that are out there in this world at this point, putting their love of maps to work anywhere in the state, at the Public Safety Commission, or the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Society survey, um, or to LTSP, or to students who are working at Uber, or small design firms, or the federal government. The Census Bureau say it was a more rigid environment, and we want it to be no other way, right? But I have a student who's there who's been able to take some of the learning experiences and the culture that we cultivate in the lab and integrate that into his practices, creating learning sessions and ways to connect with his colleagues. Well, it wasn't on the Maps to Save the World campaign, Maps had this way of finding their way into every aspect of the work that I was doing. And learning and designing cultures and teams started making their way into every making experience that I was leading. So these two things were coming together. But I was searching for meaning. I was searching for more impact. And, and what, what are we doing that has that impact? The first real outcome of this, outside of my normal production, was map giving. Not to be confused with the department's map give, which came around after this. Uh, it was a nonprofit that I had started with some colleagues. Our tagline was given to you to give to the world. The idea was that we wanted to help nonprofits understand the power of maps to tell their stories better. Um, both to funders, to, to partners, to participants. The ability to communi communicate the importance and distribution of their work. Making these connections turned out to be a lot harder than I expected. In most of the meetings that I had, I would meet with people and, and they would say, great, we need a map to show where the location of our office is. It's not quite what I had in mind, and you all understand that. I didn't anticipate that 10 years later, after, after launching this, that we would start something in the cart lab called the Design Challenge, um, which very much grew out of the initial work that we had done here. I continued to try to get traction, but also continued to wonder, what else? How does our work have meaning? I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't quite to the more enlightened appreciation for, the, for making that middle career has offered me. So I kept searching for that meaning, that impact. Maybe it was the educational component of the work we do. I explored the ideas around the overall goal of the work that we do, change, impact, educational. I thought about our impact in helping people think spatially, understand the world and the products I was making. Books that teach geography or concepts that have geographic component, general atlases that inform about global patterns. I was making all of these. This is an atlas that has a stated goal of impacting state policymakers in Florida, or creating cartographic products for the industry, or the video game that we worked on to help fourth graders learn about their state. Maybe, maybe I was finding that elusive meaning, but what else? What about maps can help us understand the biggest abstract components of the world we live in? Cultural awareness of the land we stand on, the feet we touch, or our feet touch this land, but who touched it before us, and why and how has that changed? We had the opportunity to help a PhD student, Jesse Conway, create maps of one which was so large, this is, this is the map here, which was so large that it had to be printed by a billboard company. Tribal elders came to the map and told their stories. The point was to cap capture relationships with water. You can see here the, the interaction that's, that's happening as people write their stories on this map. What was amazing that happened that we didn't anticipate was tribal elders came to this map and they said, I can't possibly condense my story to this map to some short form written, written output. And so they would stand on the map and they would walk along the river and they would tell these rich stories of different experiences. What I wish we had done is recorded all of those. 
it was beautiful and it was impactful and it was this connection and it brought people together and, and people would add on one another's stories and there was this amazing connection that was happening over the map. Or maybe it's in visualizing climate change. This application puts people in real context to what our climate might look like um, by situating us in that, cur in that current location based on, on climate models. Now, I kept searching. Maybe I felt like I, the searching was necessary because so little of my work is focused on site analysis or, envi or environmental impact. Those of you who do that work likely see immediate need and results of the work that you do and know the value. This is an experience that I hope you'll share with me. I'd love to learn more about it. What keeps you going? What excites you? But I dribbled in other opportunities, partnering with my colleagues, grateful that they had picked up and carried right along with me. Thank you, Jimmy Martindale. Maybe it would be through connection to people outside of the lab. So we brought people to us. We brought kids to teach them about maps. We made map sandwiches. Don't they look delicious? You can see that this is a combination of points, marshmallows, we also had chocolate chips, and polygons, which was the honey and the nut butter substitute, and lines with the, with the pretzels, and we had licorice, and we had all kinds of things, and we asked them to create a map of these materials. We also taught them GPS. We talked about the history of cartography. We created many major experiences so they knew what it would feel like to attend classes as a cartography major. We hosted a lot of events over the years. And air camps, and on conferences in Madison that brought people in from around the country. We invited guest speakers from young, exciting companies, other universities, and alumni dropped by. But was that it? I was still searching. We went to people. We taught in classrooms at different ages, from preschool to high school. We went to the state fair, along with other university events. We started to go farther. A group of 11 students and staff toured organizations in New York a few years ago. Starting at Cardo, going to the New York Times. We had lunch with all of our colleagues that work in New York. It was great because at the big table we were sparse, we were, we were sort of woven in, braided between students and professionals and that experience for us to bring the, the discipline closer and expand it into people who are just entering the field. We went to MapSend in downtown Manhattan into this beautiful new office and then we buzzed over to the UN, a very different environment, but important for students to see the range and the activities in which they can participate. Then we went on to GONYC where the students presented and the next day through the New York Public Library on a tour and meeting with their labs team. And then finally going through the Office of Emergency Management. We attended conferences and engaged in the industry serving boards. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ken. Um, this is from a few years ago. And as, as the conversation continued yesterday, I, I, I felt like the point of this this um, slide is really to talk about connection across our industry. And I wanted to pause for a moment and acknowledge Ken's willingness to share the critiques of his book. I drafted a note this morning that I'll, I'll read. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to acknowledge Ken's willingness to stand up here and do that. An appreciation for the strength it took for the people to speak up, calling, to, calling all of us to be better and to do better. All day yesterday, it inspired discussion and debate, some of it productive, some of it not, all of it hard. This connection that I'm talking about here in the talk, the big reason I included this side of the slide in the first place as I was planning the talk, is the need for trust that we build within our collegial relationships. And the more we continue to include and seek understanding of our colleagues, the more we'll be aware of their talents. This is how it creeps into our everyday work. I'm asking all of us to look deeper, get curious, ask questions. Perhaps the assumptions we make about what people know aren't valid. Perhaps some folks are unwilling or unable or haven't prioritized self-promotion for whatever reasons, be they cultural or individual style or opportunity. So for anyone lucky enough to hold leadership positions, I would ask us all to think about how big our table is and who we invite to sit at it. Who is not there? Why aren't they? Because if we continue to invite only the friends or our friends of friends, then we'll continue to reinforce the structures that celebrate a singular type of knowledge, while missing out on the richness of experience. 
It has been a difficult and sometimes heated 24 hours, and I'm grateful that the change I have seen in my career is that it is now a conversation that we have publicly. As we continue to name structural barriers and openly discuss them, we'll be better prepared to put solutions in place. And I'm encouraged by the way leadership is changing. I see it in all levels, and it looks mar marvelously different. It's messier, and it's more inclusive, and there is great beauty in it and its products. Back to the show. Uh, and then we continue to branch out in, in our distance from home and expertise, partnering with the classics ar archaeologists and attending a dig in Sicily this last summer. We collected data to explore opportunities to tell the spatial stories of the place, its history and the chain of human connection. When I was meeting with the French researchers about this, this project, I asked them, if you, could, if you could decide what people walk out of this park understanding, what would it be? And it was clear they hadn't thought about that. They were very interested in their dig and their very specific uh, research. We only had a very small part of this park to work in. And the French researcher told me, I'd really like people to understand that they are connected to this incredibly long human chain of existence. Very similar to what we ask of people to know that they are connected to this place and that the place where we are connected matters. But the question lingered. And my ideas about scale were adapting. I was thinking more locally. What about the individual? Oh, I missed this one. And sometimes our maps went without us. Here they are being used in Senegal to track herd migration. So I was thinking about the individual. A nurse came to us who had previously worked in GIS. She said there, she thought there would be a map solution to a problem she was having. She worked at a free clinic and her patients needed access to other services which were distributed around her city. It seemed obvious what the solution was, let's make them a map. But what she told us was that her patients, most of them, are unable to read. So I gathered a collection of students and we, we had a practicum for a semester, eight, eight students working on this, to decide how we would put these, these maps in action. There were other constraints. It's a free clinic, there's a lot of donated material, they have to be black and white because the printer that they have is really Terrible. Um, she needed to be able to print them out when she needed them. Um, all of those sorts of things. The students were interested when the problem first came to us because they said, well, this is easy, we'll make an app. It wasn't something that the clients had access to, or to a phone with data, with a data plan. Um, so we put these together, we had about 15 of them, and um, these are some early versions. We had some with some directions that were very um, pictorial as well. Um, and we combined icons with um, drawings of buildings, and we, we were using what we thought were really recognizable icons. Um, and the way she tested this was she had one of her patients sit in the passenger seat and direct her to the place that they needed to be going. And <clears throat> what she found was her, her, her patient kept saying, oh, we need to turn at the place with the woman with the curly hair. And we assumed that a Starbucks logo, logo would be something that would be recognizable, but it was, a, it was a great justification for making sure that we were testing to make sure the maps were working for the people that would have to use them. But was that it? I didn't know, because I don't know precisely what I was looking for. This came to a very real head for me in the summer of 2017. I was recruited to a job in DC. It was, to me, a big deal job. I knew a handful of other folks who had also been recruited for it, and I knew who had decided to apply. One of those people was someone who had worked for the organization for many years previously. When I found out that this person had also decided to go for the position, I spent three days convincing myself not to go. It would be a waste of my time and theirs. I doubted my experience, I doubted my portfolio, my leadership, my expertise. I doubted that I was enough. But if there's anything this middle-aged soul knows, it is that there are lessons in every experience. I emerged from my three days of self-doubt deciding to go to the interview. I arrived in DC on a hot, sticky summer afternoon. I had gotten sharp new shoes, but they had been delayed in arriving. So I hadn't had a chance to break them in yet. They were fancy. I mean fancy. 
I decided to get dinner at the local, at the hotel restaurant. And I thought it would be best for me to break those shoes in a bit. I put them on, I took to the elevator, and I went to the first floor. I had on the most ridiculous outfit. I was wearing capris, remember, it was a hot summer DC day. Bright pink running socks, and my fancy new shoes. The shoes were called Elegant Conversations. On the bottom, the saying was engraved, Elegant Conversations, listen loudly, speak softly. Yep. Fancy. In spite of my ridiculous combination of attire, I felt powerful and confident. And then, the elevator door opened. I stepped out of that elevator and nearly did the splits. The bottoms of the shoes were so particularly slippery on that black and white tile floor, so I shuffled to the restaurant and collapsed into the booth. I sat there eating dinner, wondering what I was going to do. I had packed back a pair of shoes. They, however, lacked the flair and confidence that these shoes inspired. I decided that I would shuffle out of the restaurant after dinner and walk around in them outside on the pavement, hoping to scuff the bottom so that I would have more traction. I paid the dinner bill, and I waited until the waiter left so that I could not so gracefully get to my feet, like a newborn deer on wobbly legs. And again, I shuffled out of the hotel. I thought the pavement would offer a little more traction, but it was still pretty slick. I did a lap around the block in my new shoes, self-described as elegant, but feeling anything but. I shuffled around a couple of blocks. The next morning, I still had no idea what to do. Should I go with the shoes that provided confidence when I wasn't moving? Or with the safer, duller choice? What were the pros and cons of doing so? What were the risks? Would I fall on my face? Would I be unable to walk at some point in the 10-hour interview process? What I didn't realize until later is that this shoe experience represented so much of what I was going through and would continue to go through for the next several months. You see, I had been faced with two options that were exciting and terrifying, and I had the choice to put those options on and walk around in the idea of them. Or I could stick with the safe, what I had always done activity, and continue to search for meaning by staying relatively safe. Luckily, I really love the safe option in so many ways, but I was clearly searching for an adventure. A new way to test things I had learned from a cartographer and a leader within cartography. The thing cooking on the back burner of my mind while I was in D.C. was that months before I had gotten the call to interview, I had been assembling a team to run for local office. Running for office and interviewing at an organization that I had spent my career working with had me unbalanced, as unbalanced as I was in those new shoes. I didn't know which foot to stand on at any given time, always afraid that the bottom might just slip out from under me. When your feet are that unstable, there is no way you can go on autopilot. So I was constantly reminded of the message they carried. Listen loudly, speak softly. I was unable to forget that message. I set aside running for off the office pursuit so that I could be fully in the moment of the interview. I love DC. I love it so much that I try to get there very regularly. I could see myself there. I could see my family there, not a small consideration. What I had decided for the interview is that I would, I would not compete on portfolio with the person who was interviewing who had so much experience with the organization for a long time. You see, I don't create very much any longer. Not in the same sense. So instead, I would walk in and I would give them 60 minutes of my experience, the first half focusing on what I can make, showing my portfolio of work and proving what I, that I can do. However, the second half would focus on the aspect that, to be honest, I feel much more passionate about than anything else in my professional life, leading successful and creative teams. And what struck me about the 10 hours that I was meeting with people was how much listening loudly, loudly opened up a conversation that longtime colleagues told me were very different than the culture the organization had previously supported. And luckily, the shoes were holding up just fine. Back at home, following the DC trip, I wore, my, I wore my shoes. I began to strut more confidently, but the job process was slow and long, and a resolution was not coming fast enough. I had a team waiting to support me in my bid for office. One of the things that really solidified in my head during the interview process was the impact of geography, which I was carrying around as I ruminated about everything that was happening. Here, for years, I had been searching for this meaning through all of those projects and all of those, those different experiences 
but it ended up not being something that I discovered in this aha moment or a peak that I summited. It just kind of landed there. While I, wasn't, while I was preparing slides for my interview, what is the importance of the work we do? It is this. Geography is the ultimate study in empathy, and cartography is its language. I know, squishy. But let me allow, or allow me to, to um, explain. In this process of preparing for the interview, I reviewed the organization's product with a much more critical eye than I had, had done in years. As I was doing so, I channeled the cartographer that has led me on great adventures and inspires me regularly, Stephen Holloway. I once stood in the middle of a river in Montana, frozen with fear because the current was so strong, I was afraid I'd be swept away in it. Connected by humanity to that very real fear, in those moments I felt so closely connected to the land that connects all of us here at home. Connected by the water that flows here today, in Europe the next year, and Asia the following. An appreciation that happens here where my feet touch the ground matters across the globe, and the same as what happens there matters here. Geography, the ultimate study in empathy, spoken through the language of maps. We ask people to consider what it, what it is like to, to stand somewhere else and to understand what they're going through. We explore deficits, we explore surplus, we ask people to understand what it's like to live someplace else with a different experience. Who better to tell that story? And what better time to need that explanation than now in a landscape so divided? You all know how this tension ends, though, based on me standing here and Peter's introduction. In the spring of 2018, I was elected to the county board. And when I think back to his time when I couldn't find solid ground about what my future might look like, sliding around metaphorically just like I had when I stepped out of the elevator that hot evening in D.C., would I be uprooting my family and moving to D.C., or would I be stopping at the printer to pick up boxes of pamphlets with more images of my face on them than I could imagine? I remember that time of uncertainty being so deeply frustrating and doubt-inducing and emotional, not sure where to safely take the next step. And now, standing on the other side of the whole experience, I wouldn't trade a moment of any of it. I learned about the process, the opportunity, I had the opportunity to share the work I believe in. I had the opportunity to talk about the students that I believe in. And I jumped right into an election process that not only continued the cycle of uncertainty and doubt, but worthiness and enough. And as I ran my campaign and months in my eventual service in local office, I found that this was a home and a place for all of my training as a geographer and a cartographer. What do I want to see to better understand the phenomena, phenomena of impacting our county? To understand the empathy and have empathy for all of the issues going on across our county. Maps, of course. Now, I have not changed my stance on accepting a map for what it is, and I don't expect that on, not, that on their own they will save the world. I am still a middle-aged soul, after all, pragmatic to a fault. But I do see their role as one of the most important tools in understanding the breadth and layers of some of the most persisting questions that have faced our communities. In Dane County, Fred and Tim and Dave all do so much amazing work for our county, and what excites me is that they too are engaged in ways of thinking about how we can work together to bring their expertise to my standing com committee of health and human needs and to others. In fact, cartography continues to be something that gets me invited to meetings and groups doing some of the work that is so important to me. Recently, I was invited to meetings with 25 local leaders, including the DA, county judges, the public health director, CEO of the United Way, superintendent of schools, the Madison mayor, and others to address opportunity use. We've had a series of car theft and high-speed chases in our community. But I was not invited because of my role as a county supervisor. I was there as a cartographer. They recognize the need to think about the distribution of resources and the multiple layers that only a map can really elucidate. It has become my joke, it has become a joke with the work that I do with the county. Every time I raise my hand, there's a chuckle from somewhere on the floor and a comment, she's gonna ask for a map. <laughs> Sometimes I like to make the point that all I really want is the data that powers the map, or I want to build systems that allow us to map things in the future. And I whisper so that we can make maps in the future. 
Well, they continue to ask, for the, ask, is this meaningful or is that? Is this the thing you thought would be the thing? Almost daily, I do now have a better sense that no one thing is it. If we keep making and sharing our talents, we will find outlets within our organizations and beyond the work we do in our daily routine. And the things I was trying to build with map giving back when I started on this adventure came by committing to something else fully and applying the experience and training of a geography lens. And it's why we're all here in Appleton this week. Sure, we get out of the office for a couple of days, but we hope to place students in jobs. You hope to hire a student, or maybe you want to know what's happening in the county across the state, or what's, what's up with next gen 911. Or maybe you're here to learn new technology, or a new technique. At the heart of it all, it's about connections. Your feet land on the same planet as mine. You matter to me. And we want to spread this to our colleagues and, and non-spatial thinkers. We are uniquely suited as spatial storytellers to do this work. And we have a great responsibility, actually, in how we might work together to find common ground. Each careful step, all, all of what felt chaotic and accidental, had strong themes that were built in when we weren't paying attention to those. What I expected is that it would be one big thing, and we would say, oh, there it is. We did it. But what life experience has taught me is that it's the small investments every day and seeking opportunity outside of our daily environment, and it doesn't come neatly organized. Oh, I did something that had meaning today. The big ones for me that have been, that have been defined by all of these small actions over time, our community, oh, haha, -ha. I missed that one. It's actually me scolding my six-year-old from the floor. <laughs> the big ones for me are education, community, and culture. Education, both in the things we make, but also in the sessions we run. Community, we participate in a broader community. We go to them, we invite them to us. We give service to the industry. How can our specialty as map makers help us make better decisions? How can we help in ways we wouldn't have otherwise expected? And culture. Culture is a majorly important thing to me. We tinker with it constantly. We tweak it, we change it. If you don't design the culture in which you work, one will emerge. We're committed to working on this. Each year we gather to have a design alliance where everyone has a say in creating the space that we want to participate in. We look for inspiration in new places, hoping to learn from others who are working to create spaces that support creativity. So we look in unique spaces that might not originally, that you might not on first blush think of as being related to the work we're doing. We respond to what is asked for. This is a meeting of women students in the department providing a space for marginalized voices. And we support a family-friendly environment. You just never know where the next generation of cartographers may come from. And there is still, a, and there is a lot of eating, <laughs> and sometimes even themed food. The goal being that we're creating an inspiring environment in which we all want to work. Sometimes it means we just go bowling. What this leads us to is an environment where we can critique each other's work so that we can all grow together. No matter where we are, creating our lifelines of people who help us get through the day. I teach students now in applied setting how to do this work, how to transition into the professional world. This workplace requires peers' peer mentoring, access to additional support. We know how big this field is. And when they leave our space, many of them are looking for ways to transform their environment. Pulling on elements that we have the flexibility to tinker with constantly. There's great opportunity in standing in one place where we are not sure how to take the next step, so we take a small one. And we move cautiously into the new territory, but we go forward nonetheless. It reminds us that listening loudly is critically important to be stewards of empathy, and it will impact how our craft tells another story. And the shared language in this room, in this room one of empathy, in the language of maps. And the impact is not made in the grand gesture of marching through that hotel lobby and swinging that door open with confidence that gets us to where we are going, but in each and every careful step. 
or shuffle that gets us from the elevator to the door? What are the little steps you are taking every day that builds your big dreams and themes? The ideas that you have. How do you apply your work, both in everyday work experience as well as outside of your job? How are you using your incredible gifts of thinking spatially and skills of mastering the complicated technology? These are the things that I want to know from you. So, as this middle-aged soul stands here in actual middle age, feeling hopeful, this profession we share brings me fulfillment and excitement for what we can offer, some of the biggest challenges facing humanity. And while a map may not save the world, it is definitely a tool that I want in my toolbox. And feeling this hope at the middle point of my career is about the best thing I could have ever asked for, especially considering that I stumbled upon it late in my academic